Well, good noon, everybody. Thanks for being here today. Um, it's the very first of our in-person. For two years, we haven't been able to do this. So we're very, very excited to have Dennis Carter here with us today. And he's going to tell us probably more than we ever wanted to know about painting the And in and, and the history of wet shape. Yes. Been around a long time. I am told that his wife got a hold of him and said, don't forget the ladies. Oh, so yeah. apparently there's some information in there for us as well. <laughs> kind of like Dolly Madison. Wasn't it Dolly Madison who, who told her husband, don't forget the ladies? Yeah, and I'm completely programmed and I do what I'm doing. Yeah, <laughs> as, as it should be. Anyway, I put, um, I put brown bag schedules on your tables for you. You're welcome to take those with you, post it someplace so you can come back. Um, we're thrilled to have Dennis here today. Next time is Kurt Garner. So, um, and he's going to talk about the, uh, it's sort of a compendium of some of the uncommon Hoosier history that he's come about um, in his travels over the state. So um, join us again next month. And I don't think there's anything else I need to say, is there? Okay, Dennis. Well, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, everybody can hear me okay? Okay. Yeah. They wondered if we needed a microphone to look like we do. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Dennis Carter, and I live here in Plymouth, Indiana. And before I begin, I would like to take the time to thank the Marshall County Historical Society and Iris Fry for helping me give this presentation today on the history of wet shaving and shaving brushes. Wet shaving is the practice and tradition of wetting the face first with hot or warm water and applying shaving cream, which turns to lather before the act of shaving itself. Proper wet shaving uses the form of multiple passes across the face to achieve the perfect shave by eliminating whiskers and often if performed properly without any skin irritation. This art of shaving is a very old tradition that dates back into antiquity. It originated centuries ago and across many civilizations. There is no definite date when it can be said that the first man had decided to shave himself. But there are archeological findings and cave paintings that indicate that early man used seashells as tweezers to pull off facial hairs as early as 30,000 BC. By 10,000 BC, shaving had evolved to the use of flint blades in scraping the face. And you will not catch me with this in the bathroom <laughs> in the morning. The pharaohs of Egypt are known to have completely shaved their facial hairs, and they did shave their heads bald. But their method of shaving, we don't know much about. It's not known. Circular bronze and gold razors, however, have been found in Egyptian burial chambers, which suggest that they definitely used razors while shaving. Also, the oldest documented use of shaving cream is also as early as 3000 BC. And this was in Samaria and given a link between the Sumerians and the old Egyptian civilizations, one can safely assume that the pharaohs did practice some sort of wet shave. They also probably used the same form of shaving cream like the Sumerians made from animal fats and wood ash. Although it is difficult to say exactly, this started most probably earlier in history or at least, as I said, around 3000 BC. And interestingly enough, if anyone has watched the film Kingdom of Heaven, you'll recall that during the film, the knights are camped near a stream and they're cooking a small animal on a stick over the fire. And one of the knights is mixing what appears to be a form of soap in a small bowl <clears throat> to most probably shave with as he leans over to catch the fat that is dripping from the cooking of the animal into his shaving mug. This is most likely to make the soap very slick, so his knife or whatever kind of razor he is using will glide more smoothly on his skin. Up until the fourth century BC, shaving was basically for noblemen and royalty who would often have a house barber in permanent employment. This was until Alexander the Great ordered all his men to shave so that their enemies would have nothing to grab onto in close combat. Shaving then started to become trendy, and about a century after this period, Roman commercial barbers who offered their services in barber salons appeared in history. They reportedly used iron razors, and like their predecessors, would first use their razors to cut the hair low 
and then finish the shave with their iron razor. Bear in mind that these men were skilled barbers who offered straight razor shaves when common grooming services like shaving and bathing were not as easily accessible due to a lack of indoor plumbing and other comfortable standard of living resources that we enjoy in our homes today. They also employed the use of oils as a shaving cream, and since then, the art and science of wet shaving has continued to evolve. The razor designs were improved on, and even fancy razors with gold handles and decoration were made. For roughly the next 2,000 years, there was hardly any further significant development in wet shaving. The shape of the modern straight razor was already developed back in Roman times, but the iron blades they used went blunt and had to be steadily sharpened. The next development would come from England in the 18th century AD when man finally learned how to work with steel. Shaving creams also did not improve much over this time period, but the fine art of wet shaving evolved in this period. And in 1740, Benjamin Huntsman sells the first <clears throat> straight razors, or what are also referred to as cutthroat razors, <laughs> which <laughs> use hollow ground blades made from Sheffield steel. These were the principal instrument for shaving up until the early 1900s, and even until today, they are still used, and these same straight razors haven't changed much in design at all. Also about this time, the badger hair shaving brush became a shaving part of shaving culture which by now involved the use of hard soaps to whip into shaving lather. <clears throat> in 1840, the walnut oil military shaving soap from Broom and Fowler became one of the first soaps dedicated solely to wet shaving. And in 1847, a man named William Henson invents a hoe-shaped razor, which is the shape of the current safety razor. This razor design makes it possible for more and more people to shave by themselves rather than to go to a barber. This is because shaving with a safety razor is much less risky than with a straight razor. But this design is, is still needed that the blade has to be taken out and sharpened every now. Again, in this time period and in this time period, concerns about personal appearance began being <clears throat> the dominant desire that motivated facial hair removal practice. The initial wrapping of the face with a hot towel, the application of shaving creams and solutions, the shave and aftershave services, and last but not least, the smells of the barber shop all made it a delightful place to visit. And with time, the shaving techniques there were also perfected. I recall as a boy going into barber shops and smelling what was called, I think it was called Barbasol. It was in a it was like a blue liquid that was in a little tankard, and he kept all his combs and everything in it. That smell just wafted through the whole place. And then in 1903, a traveling salesman with the name of King Camp Gillette combines the hoe shaped safety razor with a disposable double edged blade design. And in 1904, patents it. I have here with me a copy of Mr. Gillette's original patent drawing that went to the patent office, the very first safety razor. He sold his razor very cheaply at a loss, but his <clears throat> ulterior motive was to make a huge fortune from the blades, which were meant to be used several times and then discarded. His invention also won a contract with the U.S. Army for three and a half million razors and 32 million blades during the First World War. This is a packet that went with the soldier in World War I. The soldiers were encouraged to shave often, they still are, and when they returned, they were also allowed to keep their razors. This made them continue to purchase Gillette's blades, which turned him into a very, very rich man. The same design hasn't changed much since then in the popular Moulet, Mercur, Edwin Jagger, Gillette, and other double-edged safety razors of today still have this same shape. Companies have marketed their shaving products in ways that link the use of the products 
product with an increase in the user's attractiveness, masculinity, <coughs> or femininity. As an example, a 1910 Gillette advertisement in Cosmopolitan Magazine stated, and I quote, woman is the great civilizer. If it were not for her, man would revert to whiskers and carry a club. <laughs> woman does much for the Gillette because it is her presence, her influence, that puts the emphasis on good clothes, clean linen, and a clean shave. She admires the clean, healthy skin of the man who uses a Gillette. She does not approve of the ladylike massage finish of the tonsorial artist. This massaged appearance has ceased to be class, largely because she says so. There is something fine and wholesome about the Gillette shave. It does not reek of violet water and pomades. A million men will buy Gillette this year. Now is the time to get yours. And also bear in mind that at this time, and especially in our larger cities, personal care products, which remove unwanted hair <clears throat> from the face and body, were developed to address interwoven concerns about hygiene and personal appearance. Removing body hair helps stave off infestations of lice and other parasites, especially for those who lived in close quarters and who had limited access to bathing. Because hair traps perspiration, it can become a breeding ground for bacteria and odors. And for these reasons, by the early 1900s, being clean shaven had become associated with basic hygiene. I recall three years ago when I was in the hospital having an operation, the nurse came in in the evening and she said, I'm going to shave you tonight. And I said, okay. So she came back and she shaved me and I asked her why. I had a mustache for 45 years, that's a long time. You know? And she said, well, she said, because it traps perspiration and bacteria, we don't like that in the operating room. I said, okay. I couldn't tell her no anyway, but the next morning my wife walked in and she said, I said, well, how do I look? And she said, well, you look a lot younger. <laughs> well, that made the old, you know, I, gee, I feel old meter jump about five points, you know, so, hey, I left it off. Yeah. Back to this. And now in the 20th century, the safety razor had been <clears throat> much popular, especially after the First World War, and many men had taken to shaving by themselves, and a new culture developed. This new male culture was the morning ritual of wet shaving with a single-bladed safety razor. And although many changes have come and gone, none of them could offer the efficiency and psychological benefits of the wet shave using the traditional methods. And let us not forget that it was around the turn of the 20th century that women also became the focus of wet shaving. Up until that time, it was uncommon for women to shave under their arms or to shave their legs. But what we call American beauty standards and practices for women were also affected by the innovation of the safety razor. Beginning in the earlier 20th century, manufacturers of safety razors seeking to expand their market promoted the idea that body hair on women is inherently masculine and indelicate as well as unhygienic. Women in many large cities began showing their ankles in public. <clears throat> And in 1915, Gillette jumped right in as the first company to introduce the first safety razor marketed specifically to women. It was called the Milady Decolette. In the 1920s, the fashions for sleeveless tops and shorter dresses became all the rage. And now that the armpits and legs of American women were now much more visible in social situations, shaving company advertisers seethed this opportunity to encourage women to shave their legs and under their arms. Because the term shaving was associated with masculine facial hair removal practices, marketers were careful to not use that term in their advertising. They instead encouraged women to make their legs and under their arms what they called smooth, something the vast majority of women in this country still do today. It's interesting also, and I don't have one with me, it was kind of hard to find one, but a company actually made a razor. It was a safety razor, except it was round. And the blades they sold with it were round. And it fit 
right in under your arm. So you were trying to <clears throat> use a man's razor or a lady's razor that looked like a traditional razor, and you might cut yourself. I find that interesting. And likewise, razors were not marketed to women for any kind of facial hair removal. Instead, women with facial hair were offered products to bleach, wax, or dissolve facial hair. And in 1927, Lieutenant Colonel Jacob Schick of the U.S. Army invents the first electric dry razor. Shaver, I should say. It becomes a hit, and he sells millions of units. Although dry shaving with an electric razor was less desirable than wet shaving, the relatively high price of replacement blades for safety razors push people away from wet shaving with a razor. Electric razors did, however, make hair removal more convenient and less dangerous. But some men and women could not afford this new way of shaving as the initial cost was more expensive and they kept right on wet shaving. Now let's talk a little bit about the Gillette Corporation in the 1940s through the 1960s. Now Gillette had been making safety razors for 50 plus years. But in the late 40s, early 50s, that's 1940s and 50s, they decided that every man and woman did not need the same exact blade exposure or level of effectiveness with their shaving. Some men in those days had as they do today, lighter beards. Some men had kind of what we would call a medium beard, like most men. And some men had a very rough or, or, you know, a lot of whiskers, very, very coarse whiskers. So they believe that one size does not fit all. So they came up with a very effective marketing <coughs> campaign for what they call the Super Speed Trio of razors. They built a blue tipped razor for light shaving a tan tip razor for medium shaves and a red tipped razor and the, and the colors were down here at the bottom of the handle where you twist to open it for more aggressive shaving or for heavy beards. This is a medium. This had the tip. It's been washed so many times the paint's gone, but this is one of the old twist to open super speed mediums. It was so successful that the two men at Gillette that invented that named Meyer J. Schnitzler and Michael Benedict Jr. went even further and invented the adjustable razor. The first models had a toggle at the bottom that locked the razor in position after you installed the blade and set the blade adjustment with a hand dial that could be set from one to nine. One being further away from your skin, nine being a more aggressive shave. These razors were sold to the public but were considered experimental. And they were a bit on the expensive side for most people. So never to stop at one style or design, Gillette's marketing arm kept asking the owners of their razors, is there anything else you would like added to this adjustable razor we have produced? I don't know if anyone remembers, but I do remember my father shaved with a adjustable razor. And he had in the bottom of the plastic tray that you opened it with, there was a little card. And it said, if you let it there, if there's anything about this razor you don't like, send this, write it down and send it in. You know, it was like customer relations right there in your back. You know, it was kind of neat. Today, you call somebody and you're talking to Bombay or something like that. <laughs> well, people answered with the idea of what we now lovingly call the Fat Boy Razor. In internal memos at Gillette, this razor was originally called the Aqueous. They weren't sure where to put the adjustment dial on this new razor. So they put it at the bottom of the handle down here. And I have brought a copy. This is the original patent for the first adjustable <clears throat> razor. On this razor here, you see the adjustment handle is right under the head when you twist to open. And on this patented drawing, it's down here at the bottom. Why fat boy? Pardon me? Why fat boy? Because it is short and stubby and it's fatter than any razor they ever made. So. It really wasn't called that by the Gillette people. They called it the Model 195. And what year was but that? the barbers and the guys that owned them and everything started calling it the Fat Boy. What, what year was that, Dennis? Pardon me? What year was that? Uh, not, but, uh, well, the 1958 is the original Pat. This is a, uh, this one is third, third quarter, which would be September, um, September of 1959. Gillette actually 
mark these razors underneath with, with letters and numbers. And if you, I have a code at home, you can tell what year they were made and what quarter of the year of that year. Kind of interesting. Well, what's funny, that's the name of the bomb that dropped hit on Hiroshima. <laughs> oh, okay. That, that is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I never, you know, that never crossed my mind before. I remember, yeah, I remember, I remember that in history, but I never crossed my mind before that. Well, maybe somebody in the Air Force called it that. Somebody else started calling it that. I don't know. Well, people weren't too happy with the adjustment valve at the bottom of the hands. Because it was there, they held the razor in their hands while they were shaving, and they didn't want the dial, you know, to move around while they were. And where the, it's also where the twist knobs located to open the razor. So after people told them to change this design, Gillette moved the dial to just under up under the area that holds the blade. And bear in mind that the adjustments on this fat boy razor incorporates all of the settings of the prior super speed trio of razors. This model razor was marketed as the model 195. Talk about simplicity, it cost $1.95. And in 1960, Wilkinson Corporation made the first disposable stainless steel blade. It was cheap, it could be used a few more times before disposable than the, the black or steel blade. Gillette and other firms followed suit. Consumers began loving these blades and wet shaving was again, very affordable and popular. This disposable stainless steel blade is still manufactured today and still used all over the world for clean, efficient and cost effective shaving. I recall my father before the, the stainless steel blades came out, and I was a kid that always watched Dad shave. I don't know why, but it's just kind of cool. And I remember him taking and opening up his twist to open Gillette, and he would take out his blade and wipe it with the <coughs> get all the water off of it. And I asked him one day, I said, why do you do that? And he said, because I don't want this to be rusty tomorrow when I pick it up. Interesting. And in 1974, Bic manufactures the disposable Shaving razors and other firms follow suit. Soon Gillette is manufacturing double bladed and triple bladed plastic disposable shavers and they are introduced to the public. These multi blade razors claim to have close shaved closer using a technique called hysteresis. We have all heard the pitch. The first blade cuts the whisker, it further pulls the hair from the follicle, allowing the additional blades to cut even shorter. Wet shavers refer to this theory as the tug and cut method. This development has continued today into products like the Gillette Mach 3 razors, which have morphed over the last few decades into the ProGlide and Fusion powered razor cartridges. Manufacturers continue to buy for mass market shaving dominance each and every year. But in the end, the straight razor remains the most cost effective means of shaving with the traditional double-edged razor being a close second. Although the straight razor is the most economical razor for wet shaving, it is still regarded as only for the most daring men because of the dangers of shaving with it. I have never brought myself to the point where I will do that. I thought about it many times. I do own some straight razors. They're not sharpened professionally, and maybe that's the reason, but they need to be sent out and done if I was going to fool around with that. And I'm not going to, I don't think. This is where the traditional double-edged safety razor comes in and why it is so popular and has recently been increasing in popularity again. Some of the reasons men give for reverting to traditional wet shaving methods are the cheaper cost per shave. The male tradition it's what my father did. It's what my grandfather did. It's a very clean shave compared to other forms of shaving, You're using soaps and antiseptics and things, which avoids the skin conditions due, due to the soaps and antiseptics after shaves used. And it's environmental concerns. Some people don't like throwing a plastic razor in the trash. And the sheer pleasure of it. I consider wet shaving to be ultimately a philosophy for approaching how to shave. And I offer these categories to identify an individual's preferences. The classic wet shave. This is performed with hot water, a straight razor, shaving soap, brush, and mud. The traditional wet shave, which is hot water, a traditional safety razor, shaving soap, brush, and mud. And the modern wet shave, hot water, cartridge razor, shaving soap from a gel, a can, or mud. 
The pre-shave routine off softens the whiskers, which is done by showering or splashing hot water on the face. Personally, I don't shave that way, but showering I have found because I have shaved after I shower. And I can tell you if you shower or shave right after you get out of the shower, man, those whiskers come off a lot easier. That hot water really makes them soft. Barbers sometimes use a hot towel. Then you shave with the grain, load up with soap again and shave against the grain. And then soap up again and shave across the grain. This is known as the triple pass shave. And we all remember those days as children when our fathers and grandfathers stood at the mirror using a safety razor, swishing the razor in a sink full of hot, steamy water, and have found as they did that there is much pleasure to be gained from shaving yourself daily with a traditional single-bladed razor. <clears throat> Looking at yourself in that mirror with your shaving cream covering your face reminds you each day who you are and how far we have come. <laughs> The hair grow angles on a man's face, and there are different, they're almost like a <clears throat> fingerprint, how the hair grows out on a man's face. Um, in order to assess the angles, a man must allow his facial hair to grow out a bit. My own facial hairs, the left side of my face, my hairs grow straight down. Here under my chin, they all grow this way. My right side of my face, they all grow towards my right ear, and above and below my lip, they grow straight down. And why that is, I don't know. But that is how I shave everyone. <laughs> Kinds and types of shaving soaps. Shaving soaps come to us in several forms. Soaps can be hard cakes, the little round hard cakes you see in the stores. The creams, like I, I use a cream. Gels or can. Obviously, everyone knows what a can of shaving cream looks like. I use the cream type in a metal tube. It has the aroma of sandalwood, which I really, really like. The primary function of a shaving soap is to act as a lubricant between your skin and the sharp razor blade in combination with the preferably hot water to soften the hair you're shaving off. The highest quality shaving soaps contain high levels of fat and glycerin. Glycerin is important because it locks in water and hydrates the skin. It also softens the whiskers and leaves the skin, skin soft and moisturized. The fat content provides the necessary lubrication for protection from getting nicked by the razor blades. Brands of razors. There are many brands of razors and I have found as in most things, you get the quality that you pay for. Edwin Jagger, Mercur, and Moulet are the top brand of safety razors of today. And I would add here that Gillette has also, again, a few years back, started producing and selling the traditional double-edged single-bladed safety razor. Reason being that men have rediscovered that the traditional wet shave is enjoyable. It is interesting that in the 1970s, when the cartridge razor blades, the Mach 2s, and the, became popular in the United States, the single-blade razor was not a big seller in Europe or Asia. Companies in other countries like Pakistan, Russia, Turkey, and India kept right on producing the traditional single edge safety razor blades that are still used today. And now we come to what are called aftershaves. In the modern world, and for most of us, shaving is a daily ritual. Many people hardly even think about it anymore. And what do we <clears throat> do after we shave? We lovingly Flash on an aftershave or rub a balm on our faces. Aftershave is a lotion or balm rubbed on your face after shaving to moisture and disinfect it. Shaving is not natural. It is hard on a person's face. The idea of running a super sharp razor over your face does some amount of damage to the top layers of your skin. Electric razors also do the same kind of damage. Old Spice, Aqua Velva, Menon Skin Bracer, Edward Pinot, Brute English Leather, British Sterling, and Stetson are some common brands of aftershaves. All aftershaves have denatured alcohol or some sort of disinfectant in them to help stop any possible bacterial infections we might have after we shave. In the days of old, this was a major concern because before we had antibiotics and antiseptics, 
a person could die from simple infections. Modern aftershaves contain three major components. The first and most important is an antiseptic. Most common type, again, is denatured alcohol. Some use stearates, citrates, and witch hazel are also used. They work by killing off the bacteria on the face before they can get into a cut after the shave. The next is a moisturizing agent. Shaving soaps and creams can and do dry out the skin and make it feel uncomfortable after <laughs> your shave. Moisturizers contain one or several components, including shea butter, cocoa butter, olive oil, or coconut oil. These will keep your skin fresh and healthy. But it is the fragrance that is the most common reason that men buy aftershaves. And there's nothing wrong with that. There are a myriad of fragrances and the hundreds of different brands of aftershaves used by men today. The most common are essential oils and herbs like bay leaves, rum, sage, sandalwood, lavender, lilac, citrus, and many, many more. Some men do not like aftershaves and do not use them due to the fact that they sting and they burn. But this is the reason aftershaves are so important. The sting means those tiny cuts and abrasions are being sterilized and a man should always use some kind of aftershave regardless of how you shave. Ingrown hairs and infected cuts are not pretty to look at and dry skin on your face looks aged and unhealthy. Historically, the Egyptians began using these essential oils and other scents around 4,000 years ago. But this was to cover up smelly people rather than for any hygienic reasons. <laughs> the Romans were the civilization that created the professional barber who not only cut hair, but shaved his customers also. They did not have Old <clears throat> Spice, but they did notice when someone got cut, there could be an infection that could start. Germ theory was lost on them, but they did come up with a plaster made from herbal components that was rubbed on the face after the shave that lessened the problem. But it was Louis Pasteur in the Victorian period, I hope I said that right, that discovered infections were caused by bacteria or what we call germs. And he found that alcohol and other components seemed to kill them and the stage for aftershaves was set. And in 1830, a French cologne and perfume maker named Edward Pinot was commissioned by the Hungarian cavalry to come up with an aftershave that had alcohol and fragrances that would be pleasing and that was to be used by the troops who were required to be clean shaven daily. This resulted in what was called lilac vegetal. It was a big hit with the troops and this very same company makes this that very same aftershave and other fragrances today. Bay Rum is another old aftershave that was created in the 1870s by the islanders of the Virgin Islands. Using rum, citrus, cloves, cinnamon, and bay leaves and distilling these, and Bay Rum was born. It won the prestigious Centennial Award in Philadelphia in 1876 and is still used by many men today. Brut was created in 1963 by Fabergé. With aggressive masculine scents of sandalwood, lavender, oak moss, and jasmine, it is one of the most popular men's fragrances available. Almost every man has used Brut at one time or another. And who can ever forget the American company <coughs> Dalton and their brand Old Spice? Born in 1937 by Mr. William Schultz, the scent was inspired by his mother's potpourri that was always wafting through their home when he was a boy. This shaving soap and aftershave lotion had a nautical theme for their packaging. In 1990, Procter and Gamble purchased the Old Spice fragrance line and the other skincare lines from the Shelton Company. And in 2008, Old Spice was repackaged as what we know today as the original classic scent that we know and love. And the ad of the day was, if your father or grandfather had not worn it, you wouldn't be here today. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you that my father's hat, shirt, coat, suit, and pickup truck smell like old spice. <laughs>
<laughs> and maybe consequently the ad was true, as there were six children in our family, and my father was an old spice man. <laughs> okay, the styptic pencil. Anyone who has ever used a razor to shave with has at one time or another nicked or cut themselves. My father would at times come from the bathroom with a small piece of tissue stuck to his chin. And he always took, I always made sure he took that off when we went into church. You know, that was very <laughs> odd looking, you know. Uh, uh, again, a small nick on his chin. Interestingly enough, I never did see a styptic pencil in his shave kit. I don't know why. A styptic pencil is made from a substance and hydrous aluminum sulfate that promotes hemostasis, which is the scientific name for stops bleeding. Made from the same materials as the <clears throat> granular powder that is poured on wounds. If you've ever seen a war movie and someone might be shot and someone tears open a, they, it cont contracts blood, blood vessels, severed blood vessels. And in the case of shaving, it constricts the small capillaries in the face causing them to stop bleeding. Before safety razors were developed and people used straight razors to shave, it was part of a man's shaving kit. It is much more economical to use a traditional double-edged razor blade and razor than it is to use a cartridge razor blade. In most cases, a modern cartridge razor blade costs three to four dollars each. I buy traditional stainless steel double-edged razor blades like these for eight and a half cents each. There's a hundred here. I pay fifteen dollars for a hundred blades. That is quite a cost difference. That is something to think about when it comes to shaving money or saving money, excuse me, while shaving every day. But anyway, you have any way you shave always has been and always will be up to the individual. I personally find it pleasing and satisfying to get up every day, run a bunch of hot water in this bathroom sink, and spend the next 10 to 15 minutes or so experiencing wet shaving. Good. That smell of sandalwood, the warmth of the water, and that lather-filled soap brush on my face, that crisp sound that razor makes on my face as it removes all those unwanted <laughs> whiskers, and the aroma of the day that is left on my face when I'm thorough through shaving. I believe that all of my five senses are tested to the limit when I wet shave my face. Running my hand over my face and feeling no stubble reminds me that I just coddled and spoiled myself a bit. My face is smooth and after I drown it in aftershave, I think it smells great. I enjoy the traditional shave and how it is so special to me. For me, it is a very clean feeling and it's something that makes me feel good. I look forward to shaving every morning. And now I would like to tell you a bit about shaving brushes. Now, I have never been to a shaving brush factory, so I don't know how they <coughs> make shaving brushes. But I make shaving brushes, too. And I, I use wood. And I suppose a lot of other companies do also. I find a block of wood. And this is very easy for me because I have a wood burner. And I have a bunch of wood at home. And it's walnut, it's oak, it's beech, it's cherry, it's ash, it can be anything. I even found some sycamore burl in there, which is really pretty. And I take that block of wood and I take a pencil and I make, this could be rectangular, it can be round, it can be square. Usually I cut it in a saw, so I make it square. I find the center by drawing a pencil line from <coughs> corner to corner, or if it's round, so sometimes I have a dowel, I find a, there's a center finder that you can set on the, on the round wood and it will show you go both ways with it to show you the center. Then I take what is called a Forstner bit. Now this thing will drill a hole in the wood, but it leaves a flat bottom in the wood. It doesn't have an angled bottom, it's flat up the side. And I drill out to the depth of whatever shaving knot I'm going to be using. I then slip a little device called a collet inside there. And with a wrench, I tighten it up. And what it does is that collet expands inside that drill hole and it locks itself into place. I then do the other thing with the other side and I make sure I find the center of it. 
Now I've got one perfectly centered hole and I have a center on the other side that my tailstock can slide into. I put this with the collet on it in the lathe and I lock it down. And then I bring the tailstock in at the center of the back and I lock it down. Now I have a piece of wood center to center in my lathe ready to cut. I then use, I didn't bring it with me, but I did have eight or nine different wooden tools and I shape the shaving brush. Most shaving brushes, and there are several different shapes and sizes, are, can be two inches to three and a half to four inches long. There are different shapes. These are all ones that I have made. This was made from oak, this is walnut, this is maple. And you shape it with your tools. When you're finished and you get down to the point where you say, well, that looks kind of nice, or you put a, maybe some lines in it to kind of give it a little extra look to it. You then leave it in the lathe and you stare at it and wonder if it's okay. You stare at it in the lathe and then you take sandpaper. And you start with 120 grit and you work your way all up to 600. And you take every mark out of it that the cutting tool, you know, cut into the wood. That takes a little while. We get that all done there, and then I take the, the shaving brush into the house, and I have a little device in there that turns at six revolutions per minute, which is very slow. And it has a little wooden like screw sticking out from the center of it, and I drill a little hole in the center of that shaving brush, and I thread it onto that little doodad, and it's gonna turn six RPM. Then I open up a can of varnish, and I stir it up, and I take my little device and my little thing's turning, and I dip it in the varnish and I pull it out and I set it down and I let it sit there for 24 hours. I then do that again and again and again. Three, well, four to five times, depending on the wood. Walnut has a tendency to want to suck the varnish up real fast, so you usually use five or six coats on it. But on any other wood, four is enough. Then I decide, what do I want? There are four different kinds. I do One of these. Okay. The part that fits inside, sorry, I had this out on the table, I'm sorry. This is called a shaving brush knot, K N O T. These come in four different types of hair badger. Hog, horse, and synthetic. Those are the four types of knots that are sold for shaving brushes. And I have them all here. This one is badger, very soft, very luxurious, kind of on your face when you make soap with it. This one is hog. This is hog hair. A little stiffer for a guy that really wants to work in that soap. You know, this is a little stiffer, um, but I have a secret way to soften it up a little bit without having to use it all the time. The other is horse. This is a horse hairbrush, a little softer like the badger. And this one is synthetic. It's made to look like hair, but it's actually a nylon. I then take it, <clears throat> done with my varnish and everything, and I put a two-part epoxy. It's a marine gray because I want to stand up the hot water or any kind of water that's going to be dipped in. I always throw my shaving brush in the hot water because I want it to be warm when I use it. And I put uh, a coat of that inside of here and I put a little tiny bit on the bottom and then I put the, the knot in and turn it about a quarter turn. And then I stand there and look at the clock and wait five minutes because it takes five minutes for the marine epoxy to set up. When I'm finished, it's dry in 24 hours. You have shaving brush. It's not, some of these, now, you, you people are more than welcome to look at these after the presentation. Some of the woods are fantastic. I just love the look of them. They almost look like rock. They're, they're just beautiful. So do you sell those to us? Or? I don't, but I've given a whole bunch of them away. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, if you want one. If it works out, I'm not keeping I give you one. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions for me at all about shaving or shaving brushes? or Yes. How do you get the hair from the badger? How do I get it? How does anyone get it? I'm not certain I know the answer. 
I don't know if they raise them like foxes or if they catch them in the wild. I don't know. You can't really sneak up on a badger. I wouldn't want to. No. I once had one living you know, where I lived, and it, uh, my kids fought them. They were little, and I was like, don't go back there. You know, they're pretty nasty animals. And what's good is this one? Pardon me? And Westgate subdivision? No, 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 okay. no. This was when I was younger and I missed the country. Like, yeah, live out the country. But there's uh, something else? Yeah. When I was in Boy Scouts, uh, we used to make uh, wood carving uh, tools out of the old uh, straight razors. Oh, really? And my uh, scoutmaster, uh, the gentleman that taught us how to do that, always swore by uh, the German uh, straight razors. He always said they were the, the very best. I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. I, you know, he could be very well be right. Solingen is a company in Germany that has been around forever, and they make some of the best knives. I mean, right. not the knife material that you've ever seen, even the stainless steels that are used today. Um, but I would say that's probably I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt that one bit. I wouldn't doubt that one bit. The thing with the thing with anything, whether it be a freight or anything, sometimes somebody will buy one and really like it, and they hang on to that. You know what I mean? Because they like it so much. Um, again, I, I'm, I, I'm debating whether or not to send this thing out. This was uh, Mary's, uh, my wife's uh, great grandfather's. And uh, it's the name on it is uh, Diamond Razor, Boston, Massachusetts. Um, if they, you can send these out and they will actually, there are companies, there's one in Adrian, Michigan, that will professionally sharpen this and it'll be ready to go. When I, when I get it, I can shave with it. You know, I think it's thirty dollars or something, but they professionally sharpen and send it back. <clears throat> and I thought about doing that, but I, I just want to keep that skeptic pencil real close. You know, if I try. <laughs> I do have another question. Yes. Uh, I remember uh, I've always collected old and expensive things. Generally, um, one of the things that I remember seeing, and I've only seen it a couple of times, it was a round disc, and you would put your safety razor on it. And you would turn it, and there was a, uh, a very fine, like a thousand grit stone that would sharpen it. Really? Wondering, uh, you know, was this something that was made by Gillette, or was this something in aftermarket? I have not seen one of those before. Uh, Mr. Gillette would have never sold something like that. He wanted you to buy his blades, you know. <laughs> okay. uh, but, however, that one piece I showed you, this razor blade in this razor, this was before Gillette. Had to be taken out and sharpened and then put back in and to shape with. Now it's a possibility that somebody might have made something like that for something like this. I, I only saw that at auction twice, and I regret never buying one. But it was uh, it was an amazing contraption. <clears throat> yeah, we have some of them. Did you have one here? <laughs> oh wow! I, 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 they I they, like they are so cool. Yeah, we'll have to watch it though. Invention, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Invention is the mother of necessity, you know. If somebody wants to sharpen something, they're gonna think, find a way to do it. At the History Center in Bremen, we have a device like that. It has a, a piece of leather and you turn the crank and the and the blade flips over yeah. back and forth. All you do is crank it, and it's just like sharpening your your uh, razor blade. And it's so interesting. Available for anyone who wants to see it. Or yeah. see my, my grandfather shaved a straight razor, and I remember he had a razor strap. He right. stuck the razor in it, and he pulled the strap back and forth. Is that kind of similar to what you're doing? No, this, this is a little machine. Like a wheel? No, this is a little device where yeah. you put the safety razor blade on it, and it's sharpened there. Oh, it's for a, a safety razor. That's That's safety razor. Gotcha. And it flips it over. So you turn wow. it back and it flips over and it's sharp as the other side. That is fascinating. I have a strop at home. It was just given to me by my, by my uh, brother in law. And it's old, it's from the 1800s. It's the working <laughs> company and all that on it. And uh, I have one at home. So if I ever did have that sharpened professionally, I probably would have a strop and ready to go. Yes, sir. You give me your e email address and I'll send you a picture of it. We'll do that afterwards. Yeah, that, that'd be wonderful. Anyone else have any? Yes, again. Just a question on the stropping. Uh, you know, there are so many different theories uh, on, on how to strop a razor. And I was just curious what your thoughts were. I would do it like in a, 
I would do it like at a 30 degree angle. I would kind of hold it like this and then, you know, just, just draw it back and draw back. What you're actually doing with a strop is you're breaking the edges of the edge. So there is no edge. I mean, there's just a pure edge. You're not have one, the, the, you don't have the metal hanging over one side or another. You're breaking that off, which gives you that super sharp edge. I don't, I, I think I would stand there and practice a while with it. Yes. In the mid 60s, talk about direct marketing, they got a tech mag. I don't know if you're familiar with the it. dial. The dial. Had yes, a, I remember. A band, and you uh, turn the dial, move the band over. Right. And I'm not quite sure. I used it. I don't know how much, how long that lasted. But the, the things that they put out on the market. That that was fascinating. What I don't own one of those, and I've always looked for one. I, I think they sell them on eBay. Every once in a while, you can find oh, one. Yeah. And they may have one of those here. It was a mm -hmm. band that was coiled up on one side of the razor head, and you would turn it, and it would move it over, so you had a new. You know, in five days, when it, one side would get built, you just turn the handle and it would move one another blade in place or another wow. part of the ribbon. It was like a wow, steel stainless steel ribbon. Oh. Yeah, called the Techmatic. That was interesting. <laughs> and then we had the injectors. Remember those? You injected the blade in with the yeah. big shake or persona. Yeah. Made those. Yeah. Uh, a company called Harry's has been pretty successful online selling <clears throat> not only razors, but I mean, blades and the entire sure. balms, pre sure. and, 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 uh, and after shaves. Um, styptic pencils. I used to have, used to use one. <laughs> I haven't found them in a year. Are they still sold? I, I bought this one uh, at Walgreens. Did right you? Here in town. Yeah. So you can still purchase them. Cool. Yeah, I bought this one at Walgreens. Yeah. Yes, Mike. Uh, could I do a, a little poll here? How many of you enjoy getting up in the morning and standing in front of the mirror <laughs> and shaving <laughs> before you have I do not. I do not. <laughs> it's, it's still a pain in the neck. Yeah, guys. I'm with you. <laughs> I guess, yeah, like, you know, yeah. You can You're weird. Your way. No. <laughs> different strokes for different <laughs> I guess. I got time now, I'm retired, you know. <laughs> yeah. So am I. I still enjoy like, Wait a minute. Oh, yeah, I got to shave, you know. I got to get ready. What prompted your collecting this? Yeah. Uh, just the fact that you yeah. enjoy the. You uh, know what, Jim? I, making these? I don't know. I, I was one day fooling around looking at razors online maybe i saw a video and i thought to myself that'd be kind of cool to have an old razor like my dad had you know and you know i, I and my dad liked um uh, my dad liked the one right after the fat boy which was this slim adjustable <clears throat> this came out about the time that john f kennedy became president and uh this was a real big seller for gillette and i i think i like this one more than all the rest but i use them all yeah, I even go back and use the old 1920s whenever it was a while, just to remind me, you know, what it was like for grandpa or great grandpa to use a razor. And believe it or not, you can still buy these completely restored, just like they just came from the factory. There are people that take these apart, and there are companies who actually make all the parts inside here, and they re-nickel them, and they, you'll you'll get this back in the mail, like we bought it, just bought it from the, it's 1958, 5060, whatever. Kind of interesting. Yes. Do you have like a website where you discuss this? Or? No, I don't. No, I don't. I, I'm not major. sure literate enough to put together a website. I have to get yeah, out of call for somebody. Oh, yeah. Do you have any literature on like how to build one of these? Or shaving brush? Yeah. Um, no, I don't. Um, I taught myself. I mean, I just got a shaving brush and looked at it and said, I can do that. You know, so. And then I bought a wood lathe and I bought the tools and I thought, no, I got a piece of a block of wood. I started playing around with it. You know? Oh, this does that. Oh, that makes lines. Oh, that makes grooves. Oh, that makes this. <laughs> and I played around with wood. I, like I said, I got a wood lot. I've got like six cords of wood in all here. What am I going to do with it? You know, I, I work through the wood lot. And I make other things. Do I make the razor handles? No, no, no. The handle for the razor. You can make handles for these. Made out of pretty wood. What kind of sites like, do you get your like beaver or your horsehair or your badger uh, brush? Bunch of different companies. You can buy them from eBay. You can buy them from the place in Adrian I spoke about. Um, there's a place in Arizona that sells them for barber knots, uh, for, I mean, shaving knots. <clears throat> you can get them from just about anywhere. If you go online and type in mm -hmm. shaving brush knot, K-N-O-T, it will give you hundreds of places where you can purchase them. The cheapest ones, though, you'll find usually on eBay. They have some really inexpensive ones. And, and remember that knots can cost $5, $10 if you buy the kind of skimpy ones. This is 
This is my own personal shaving brush. This not cost forty dollars. So you can go up there, you can get higher and higher, but it is a really, really thick silver hair badger brush. No, not. So and I really like that. But anyway, how long does the brush last? Well, this typically like that one. You know, I mean, the different I, hair. If you shave every day. I would say that this is going to the, the the knot will wear out, and I'm able to cut. I'm able to put any knots in old you know handles too, mm -hmm. which I want to do. Um, <clears throat> I would say probably about two years. And what will first start happening is the hairs, and I don't know why this is, right directly dead in the center, the hair start falling. And you end up with something that looks like, you know, the, you've got like a hole in here. You know, it's just they start falling out or wearing out or something. Male but pattern bones. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's what it was. Floyd Lawson on the Andy Griffith Show. <laughs> which That's my hobby, by the way. Um, he You'll every now and then he'll be holding the brush, the brush, and he'll be cutting it. He'll be trimming it. What's what's he doing? Trimming it. Uh, <laughs> well, he's cutting somebody's hair, but without using an electric razor. But you know, I mean, uh, I suppose he had them too. Um, I suppose he's uh, just trimming the person's hair. No, he means no, the brush. He's trimming, trimming the brush. brush. He's trimming the oh, brush. Oh, oh yeah. Things. Well, oh yeah. Well, every once in a while, if you you, I do this, and I do it when I first get the knot. I'll look at it kind of like that because I'm, you know, got glasses. And I'll look at it like that. And one of them will be sticking out. Like it come loose from the glue. Or, yeah. And I take a scissors and snip it. Yeah. You want to make a real, I don't know. It's just a thing. You know, I got to fix that. Kind of a, yeah. That's what he's doing. He's trimming off the ones that are starting to pull out. Anybody else? Uh, yes. Would they use bone? Pardon me? Bone for shaving. You said flat. You mean for that shaving brush handle? No, just yeah. uh, you're, like a blade. Yeah, yeah. Oh, instead of using the flint, the stone. Uh, not that I, not that I've uh, ever read about or done any. And I've read a lot of history on shaving, and I've never, I've never known anybody to use bone. Um, maybe for a handle or something like that. But I don't know if it would be. I don't know if it would be. I guess flint like that. Now this is a, this is an actual arrowhead that my wife's family found in the 1800s. They were farmers. And they, I've got a whole bunch of these. But anyway, uh, but this is one that somebody sat and, you know, made. And uh, it does have kind of an edge on it. I mean, it's, you know, it, it would, it, if you if you drug it across your arm, you touch yourself. So I, maybe they even worked it down even smoother or sharper so they, they could just get that thing off of that. You know what I mean? The arrow off or whatever. But um, I'm glad we've come from that part. Where do you get your soap? So, Where do you get your soap? What do I do? Use, use, use the cup and... Um, I use this. This is, in fact, I use this this morning. This is my shaving brush mug, whatever you want to call it. You can buy these online, but you know, when you get one and it has a certain like name on it or something, or some company, they're expensive. They're like, I bought four of these at an antique store for a buck. You know, yeah. I'm kind of a cheap guy, I guess. But so your soap? Yeah, Where do you yeah. buy your soap? For myself, yeah, yeah. Um, I use a brush. You know, shaving soap. A, Where do you buy your shaving soap? My shaving soap I get online. Uh, they don't sell it here in town. I didn't think so. I uh, this is Parasso. This is made in Italy. Um, it says Saponi de Barba on it, which means You're soap the barber. Okay. I'm talking about the, the soap that goes in. The hard the, soap. Oh, the cakes? The cakes. Soap. Yeah. yeah, you can buy these here in town. Yeah, you can buy it there. Right. Uh, Martin's has this. All right. It's the only store in town, though, I found out that only that sells it. So they must have some guys that, you know, traditionally. Yeah. I'm surprised not to find these at Walmart. I thought maybe they'd have this, but they don't. Um, they may have another brand, but I just didn't see one. But Martin's, yeah, you can get them. And this is some old, this is from way back. The, the Williams Company's been around for a long time. Yes? Do barbers still use straight razors? The higher end barber shops uh, in the cities and things, like Chicagoland, Indianapolis, they have barber shops down there with five chairs. You go in and tell them, you tell them, I want a haircut and a shave. And I'm telling you what, you'll get the hot towel, you'll get baby. They, yeah, and they, you know, they, and they tell you, hold still, you know, and, and you do <laughs> <you> better. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, they, they still shave you that way. And like I said, it's usually the higher end shop. Now, Dick Bourne here in town, he used to be my barber. And he used to shave, give me a shave if I wanted it. And he'd always shave the back of my neck when yeah. he was done giving me yeah. a shave. Uh, it's like a haircut. I cut the ribbon yesterday on a new on a new barber shop here on East Laporte Street. Kid's twenty four years old. 
and he invited me in for shave. He went to he went to Port Barber School, and uh, brand new young man. And he invited me in for a shave, and he he would do it with a straight razor. He says, "There you go." Anyone else have any questions? Well, I would like, oh, go ahead. Yes, well, I, do men really use those plastic throwaway things? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I did for years. I did for really? years. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. My, my father, for some reason, I couldn't get him to switch over. Um, and we were using the same bathroom when I was in high school. And I'd say, Dad, get a trap too. Come on. You know, get that old thing. But no, he, he, he liked the old. Uh, yeah. The interesting story, I don't know if anybody remembers this. Someone met, I was telling someone I was going to give this presentation today last week, and he said to me, oh, well, that's fine with me, but okay. We like to I, I didn't want to say this last week. Somebody's got to go back to work. Yeah, my father had a um uh we had a medicine chest in our house when I was growing up, and my dad bought a new house in 65. <laughs> And inside the medicine chest was a slot. Yeah. And I always used yeah. to look at that and think, I'm wondering what that's for. Oh, yeah. It's 10 years old, you know. And my dad said to me one day, he said, that's where I put my razor blades. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. I said, where do they go? He goes, downstairs. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm going to step on one. He said, no, 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 no. They, they're in the wall, son. They're in between them. Oh, I said, well, now I got to think of myself. Well, you could get a PhD trying to figure out how many years it would take. <laughs> <laughs> fill that, fill that up. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was kind of kind of cool. And you know, you could still buy a little metal ornamental thing that you could put on your drywall and put your razor blades, a little slot, and put your razor blades in the wall. So I feel I think a hundred years from now when they demo that. <laughs> <laughs> when you stop to think about it, that's pretty safe place yeah. to put them. I it mean, really is. Yeah. You know, better than putting them in your waste. Yeah. Yes, sir. I grew up in an area where <clears throat> we had Burma shade signs. And I thought maybe you would be talking about some of, of that history. And that's a whole big story. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Yes. And there's a book on it. And I've worked at one point to de develop a presentation. But I found out that most people around here don't know about Burma Shape. And it's an amazing story. Yeah. It is. It's a fascinating yeah. story. Oh, I've read yeah. that book. Do you know how many signs were in a burn shave uh, oh, series? Lots and lots. In a series, yeah. though. They're oh, generally yeah. in a series. There were, there were like six or eight. Six, six or eight signs. Yeah. There was a standard. I don't and there's a there standard as, as to how far apart they are based on how fast you were going Traffic on that particular right. road. Right. Yeah. It is a fascinating story. We've got the book. Results are. More than welcome to look at any of this stuff. I'll leave it out on the table for a little bit. So I think Dennis would be shape happy to. It was, Burma shape cream. Yes. It was yes. yes, it was. Right. A, it started out as a shaving powder, like you know, you put it. You'd have to mix oh. it up, but yeah. And then they got into Burma shave, the canned stuff. You know, so, well, thanks everybody for coming today.